Organization of this discourse uh, by certain uh, sections of the political scene really to advance um, xenophobia, anti-Muslim sentiment. Uh, and I think in many ways the veil has come to epitomize uh, European xenophobic fears. And this is where, although I think this discussion is very important internally within the Muslim community, and I think it's very important that there is diversity there, I'm not sure that it's the right time when we have reports coming out, as we just have, showing that a Muslim woman is 65% less likely than a white Christian counterpart to find employment in this country at a time where we have uh, increasing numbers of women being attacked for their visibility as Muslim women is this the right time to say that their visibility is the problem rather than the broader political parameters fine well we'll discuss that in a moment but let's just get back to the wearing of it. I mean how do you feel when you are wearing your headscarf do you feel in some way that you are hiding yourself that you're doing it because men have asked you to that you feel the opposite of being liberated if you like you feel imprisoned by it um, I'm really not that interesting, so I'm not going to talk about myself for a variety of reasons, but I think there are very many uh, studies that we can look to that show that there are myriad reasons why women choose to wear various forms of coverings from headscarves to full face veils. And I think, of course, there are some women who have internalized and who do in fact advocate this view of women as inherently dangerous sexual creatures but I think there are also and people like Leila Ahmed one of the foremost academics on this issue point to the fact that actually there's a reappropriation of these symbols by a generation of young women who see it as a form of empowerment others see it as a fashion trend others see it as a form of identity politics there are myriad reasons why women wear uh, various forms of covering my issue is also with the broader discussion about women's dress. I mean, yet again, we're having a national discussion about women's dress, and I think that's wholly inappropriate, whether that would be about miniskirts or headscarves. Why are we talking about what women are wearing again? Do you see it as part of that bigger discussion? It is it's part just, of that bigger but, discussion. But you obviously have a, a fear, um, a worry about the veil that many people do have, yeah, and many and people just... find it difficult in, in society and in public life, seeing women walking up and down the street, they find it difficult to, to deal with because they and think we, in some way they're going backwards. We, one of the things is we don't know. We don't know because we can't know how many are being pushed, forced, compelled. We can't because the voiceless ones do not talk. I've had a more than one woman turn up at my door. One was fully veiled and grossly abused behind that veil. So I'm also saying that, that you know, we have to be able to talk about this thing as we are free to talk about the implications of some of the clothes, other clothes. And beyond I think the clothes community. are a very important part of everybody's lives and the messages. I don't think it's a side issue at all. Oh, I don't think it's a side, a side issue either. I think actually uh, the veil, as I mentioned, has become really a focus for these xenophobic fears. But uh, to come back to this issue of whether or not we know uh, whether women choose to wear it or not and, and how that can be interpreted, the point is that, you know, Arundhati Roy has got this great quote where she says, there's no such thing as the voiceless, there's only the, will the willingly unheard. Uh, and that's the point here. I mean, in, even in your book, Yasmin, at one point you see a woman in a park who's in a full face veil and you impute... Uh, motivations to her you don't engage her in a discussion and I couldn't is, well, you could her eyes were even her eyes were masked I, understand I have not seen this it is so uh, where I live where I've lived since 1978 it I hardly saw any veiled women in 1978 Muslim feminists from 1909 to the 1970s fought all over the world, including a Muslim man who followed John Stuart Mill to get rid of this. Yeah. And now I'm being told that it is empowering? I'm sorry, I really like you. And I, think, I cannot buy that. And I, and I think oh. you don't have to accept it. And I think I many know. people don't have but to accept so it. But why are so many more Muslim women wearing that? I mean, if Yasmin is right and there weren't that many veils, why is it such a, a popular thing now? Well, OK, let, let's break this down. Firstly, there is, uh, I think, a problem with a teleological view of progress so that it was, oh, we were making progress Progress. People were removing their veils and now we're going backwards. I think what we need is, is to happening. recognize that there are, there are multiple versions of modernity and multiple manifestations of hybrid modernity. That means that headscarves take on a different significance or full face veils take on a different significance today in Britain than they do in Saudi Arabia or elsewhere for a start. But also you're, you were pointing to in your book um, several people who I think have quite dubious uh, feminist credentials. You praise Lord Kramer, but this is the same Lord Kramer. I have in, said who, that in the book. Who but in let this me country come back to the suffragettes. Just, one let, question. Let, let, Can let I just come say, back on that one. How do women who veil 
voluntarily. How do they do it, knowing that their sisters in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, even here, in Canada, in Cairo, are being flogged, beaten, imprisoned, Iran, that their struggle is absolutely our struggle. What happened to sisterhood? Well, I think, I think the problem what here happened is to you don't acknowledge in your book that the very same women who are reappropriating the veil are at the front line of campaigning for the right to choose for those you know very same women. Until all women are choosing it, until you know for sure they're all not right. being flogged and imprisoned, you give it up. All I right. think you support the right to choice, actually, is what you no, should sure. do. Ladies, no, just a brief break. Difficult, a difficult subject for politicians. Um, we've That's got the example. The subject <laughs> well, and a man. It, it, but These should. It very well, yes, yes, they are. But should politicians, <laughs> about, I mean, should there be rules about what women can wear, Muslim women, particularly in court, for example, um, or perhaps in GPs' uh, surgeries? Should this be an area where politicians tread? Well, in daily life, the, the law shouldn't ban any form of clothing. It's entirely a matter of choice, yeah. unless it's in decent or something. Uh, but otherwise, no, I wouldn't uh, bring the law in here. Uh, I do think, I tend to agree with Yasmin, unfortunately I think the growing habit of wearing it is, is exciting the very unpleasant xenophobic fears and suspicions uh, that we've been uh, talking about. I, I do think there are certain circumstances where you do have to insist it's removed. One is giving evidence in court. But if it's necessary to keep, if it's a legitimate religious belief, it's a cultural belief, really I don't yeah. see how this is fixed with religion but anyway if it's a legitimate deeply held belief then you've got to screen the witness off saying only the jury mm. and the judge can see I take all those steps but sometimes the way in which we judge whether someone's telling the truth or not is partly a judgment of their facial expression. You can't interrogate somebody right. who's shielded from you behind a mask. All right, we're going to have to finish there. Just one final word from you then, Mariam. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think that we free women by criminalising them. If we're serious <coughs> about supporting women who may be facing difficulties, then we support grassroots initiatives, including by those very same women themselves. We don't seek to marginalise them, and we don't victim blame by suggesting that the xenophobia is their own fault. All right, Mariam and Yasmin, thank you both very much.